as this teaching came about, you know, I, I kept hearing for the longest time, um, betrayer or beloved. And um, this had been something that the Lord had spoken to me. And I don't say that lightly because, you know, the Lord can impress upon you, but I, I audibly heard the Lord speak to me, betrayer or beloved, for a very long time. And I could never understand what that was about. And I constantly was like, okay, I'm, 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 I want to be a beloved, Lord. I'm, I'm, you know, are you betrayer or beloved? That's a great title for a message. But as I continued to think about it, the Lord was asking me that question. Are you a betrayer or are you a beloved? And when I was younger in the Lord, I always wanted to be like John the Beloved. I wanted to be the one that the Lord told his secrets to. I wanted to rest my head upon the Lord. I wanted to be that close to the Lord that he entrusted me with his secrets. However, I always carried a heart of a betrayer, and I didn't even realize it because I'm a Christian. You know, I've walked with the Lord since I was 14 years old. I've had my ups and downs, but I've always loved the Lord, but I never understood that there was an area within my heart that was in betrayal. And so tonight's message is exposing the Judas within. And, um, you know, I, I can only share with you that it takes a very strong look in the mirror for you to really uh, expose yourself to yourself and say, I've been walking in betrayal for most of my Christian walk. And it's not something that's outward. It's something that's very, very deep-seated within. And it, you know, it talks about um, the heart of a, a betrayer has a heart trained in deception, meaning at any moment you can turn on the Lord, at any moment you can turn on somebody else, at any moment you're not going to be loyal. And loyalty and trust is a huge thing in the kingdom of God. Judas walked with Jesus. Judas was one of the 12 disciples. He was the treasurer, but he took some of the offering and he betrayed Jesus. He knew miracle signs and wonders. He had all of that in front of him, yet he was still willing to betray Jesus. Why? Because his heart was a heart of betrayal. Even though he walked with him, he still carried a heart of betrayal. And it is vitally important that we understand that our heart is deceitful. It is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And until you're willing to expose your heart to yourself, you're going to constantly walk around blindfolded, unable to really discern where you're at in your walk with the Lord. Because you can do all of the great things. You can do all of the wonderful works. You can be at a pulpit. You can be in sound. You can be leading, you know, the men and women's house. You can be, um, you know, on a platform. And you can still turn on the Lord in an instant if your heart is not pure before the Lord. And so I want to start off with John 13, verses 1 through 2. Now, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So he had already put it in his heart to betray him. But you have to have a heart open for betrayal. And how you have a heart open for a betrayal is that you don't have a heart filled with the Lord. And so I want to talk about what betrayal is. Betrayal is a violation of a person's trust or confidence and of a moral standard. And the reason why people betray is because they are discontent. So discontentment and betrayal run hand in hand. So if you're constantly finding yourself discontented with life, I want this, I want that, why can't I do this, why can't I do that, be careful. Because right there is that open door for betrayal to sneak itself in and to lay root. And um, when you're discontented, you will gr be disgruntled, you will be resentful, and you will be envious of other people. So if you find yourself in envy, really check your heart. Really look at where your heart posture is at. It's so important about your heart posture before the Lord. Because if your heart posture is closed off, you can hear the best message, you can be at the best worship service, and it will not penetrate at all. You will leave unchanged. However, if your heart posture is pure and is open before the Lord, you can be at a church that has three songs and you can be completely wrecked and obliterated because the presence of God moves within your heart. It is all a matter of your heart posture. But you first have to expose your heart to yourself. Do you understand where you're really at? 
So let's go to, um, actually, I'm just going to take this. We're going to go to Jeremiah 17, verses 7 through 10. It said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green, and it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. So understand, your heart is the character of your spirit. Your heart is your core. And the thing is, your heart also pumps blood to every area of your body, for the most part, if I'm saying this correctly. So if your heart's contaminated, eventually your eyes are going to be contaminated, your ears will be contaminated, your tongue will be contaminated, your hands will be contaminated, your feet will be contaminated, and you will make contaminated decisions, and then you will begin to contaminate other people. And it is a very, very vicious ripple effect. So you can have somebody who starts off great, but that one little seed of deception, that one little seed of envy, it'll take root, and it will contaminate your heart, and your heart will turn from beloved to betrayer. Because I, I don't think Judas initially started off with wanting to betray the Lord. I don't think we start off coming in here wanting to um, break the rules of the program. I don't think we start off coming in here wanting to uh, go out and relapse. But it happens. And it happens because your heart has never fully been converted. Because when there is a true heart change, there's a true life change. There's a true mind change. There's a true will change. And the reason why you can't maintain it is because you're, you're in management. You can have part purity, but if it's contaminated, that rotten fruit contaminates the whole bunch. That one rotten apple will contaminate every single thing else. Confirmation. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is identifying and exposing. So there's three things about exposing the Judas within your heart. And the first thing is you're going to identify and and expose it. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to crucify Judas. You're going to nail your old man to the cross. And the third thing you're going to do is live a life of a seeker. So the first thing is identify and expose. And so there's fruits to a betrayer and fruits to a heart of deception. And the first fruit, I already said it, is discontentment. So if you have discontentment, you have it because you do not have an identity in Christ. Because if you had an identity in Christ, you would realize you do not lack anything. So we're going to go to Psalm 23. And this is one of my favorite psalms because it it basically lays out everything. Actually, I think the psalms in general are my favorite, but I really, I, I love Psalm 23. And I remember as a kid, I was in choir and we sang this song. And it just would literally hit me. Every time I sang it, I had confidence because I knew that God was with me. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And going back to the first verse, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So you're discontented because the Lord is not your shepherd. The Lord is not your shepherd because you do not fully believe in him and you truly do not believe in him because you truly have not realized that your identity is found in him. Am I making sense? Okay. It's really quiet. (laughs) Um, In that, you have to understand that until you understand what your identity is with the Lord, you will constantly be looking for false fulfillment. Why do you relapse? You're looking for a false fulfillment. Why do you seek after a relationship? You're looking for a false fulfillment. Why do you have discontentment in your material possessions? Because you're looking for a false fulfillment. Because you do not have an identity in Jesus. Once you have an identity, you're not discontent anymore. You could have absolutely nothing and be completely happy. Because you have the Lord. Because in him you have everything. The reason why you get frustrated at what you do have and not having more is because you've lost sight of who he is in your life and you've lost sight of what he's done for you. The second fruit of a betrayer is double-mindedness. And it says right here 
in James 1, verses 2 through 8. So if you're looking for, you know, if you find somebody that you're close with and they're constantly contradicting themselves in the things that they say or they're wishy-washy or they're, oh, I'm going to do this one day, oh, I'm going to do this the next day. I, I, I love you today. I hate you tomorrow. That is inconsistency and that is double-mindedness and that person will betray you. It is inevitable. And, you know, that stems from, from here. I didn't think I was ever double-minded. You know, at one point I thought I could, you know, I spoke rainbows and sunshine. And it, it took me being knocked off my high horse for me to fully understand what the Lord wanted me to see within myself. And I was severely double-minded for a very long time because I constantly wondered, am I supposed to be here? Am I supposed to do what I'm doing? What if I'm not supposed to be doing what I'm doing? And I would constantly drive past and hate and what with these questions because I was trying to find a fulfillment in my identity and who I was without realizing that my identity came from him. And so I constantly, one day I was here, the next day I was like, well, if I have to leave or if something happens or if I'm going to be replaced, I have to do A, B, and C. That is a life of double-mindedness. Quit planning your life. If you're here, you're here. If you're there, you're there. But make up your mind to stay put and wait for God to lead you. It's plain and simple. And the reason why we, we are double-minded is, again, it stems and goes back to lack of identity. You are double-minded because you do not have an identity in Christ. Don't be wishy-washy. That is the worst thing that you can be. Be hot, be cold. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you from my mouth, the Lord says. So make up your mind. Are you all in with the Lord, or do you still want to dabble with the world? Because if you still want to dabble with the world, it'll welcome you back. It will. When I was young, I remember my, one of my old um, spiritual moms used to say, and she said, you know, sin is fun for a while, Vivian, but then it brings forth death. And I used to think, well, I'm not going to die by doing the things that I'm doing. But I didn't realize it meant spiritual death. The more you begin to compromise, the further it's going to take you out of God's will. And the further out of God's will you are, the harder you fall. So double-minded. Um, we're going to go to James. You guys are probably there because I'm talking. We're going to go to James 1, verses uh, 2 through 8. And it says right here, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. But let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Can God trust somebody who is unstable? No. Can he trust somebody who's double-minded? No. And that is a fruit of a betrayer. So if you find yourself tossed to and fro with your wants, with your desires, with your I'm here, I'm not here, I'm here, I'm not here, be careful because you are double-minded. And that is a setup for the enemy to come in and to pull you out of position. The third fruit is envy. Well, there, it's like a tree. It's, it's, it's a trio. Envy, jealousy, and bitterness. So where there's, uh, it says James 3.13, um, we can go there. But I, I want to kind of, first, we're going to, I'm going to say this, is that if you find yourself jealous of what your brother or sister gets or what God is doing in their lives, be careful because that is a serious open door for the enemy to come and have play with you. You should be celebrating your fellow brothers and sisters with the God moving in their lives. You should be celebrating them when they get blessed with vehicles, when they get blessed with with a job promotion, when they get blessed with, with their family restoration or when their kids come to see them, you should be celebrating with them. If you find yourself envying that, that is a big open door and that's a big red flag to you to realize that there's something wrong with your heart. You should be celebrating one another, not condemning one another, not belittling one another, not getting angry and frustrated like, why isn't this happening to me? How do you know that God's not checking to see where your heart's at with somebody else's blessings? before he knows that he can trust you with what he wants to bless you with. Because if you can't be happy for somebody else, you're not going to be happy when you get what it is you think you want. Because you're constantly going to be looking for the next big thing, the next greater thing. And it's a, again, it's a setup. It's a plot to allow that area of deception and that area of betrayal within your heart. 
So we're going to go to James 3, 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom did not, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So if you have envy and jealousy, understand that every evil thing is there. Why are you envious? Because you're discontent. Why are you discontent? Because you lack identity. Why do you lack identity? Because your identity is not found in Christ. Why is it not found in Christ? Because you have not had a personal relationship or connection with him for a very long time, if ever. You can go through the motions of a Christian walk. I can speak Christianese and great. I can. But it matters about where my heart's really at. So the fourth thing, and this might be a little controversial to some, but one of the fruits of a betrayal is materialism. And this is, this is a big thing. It's okay to have nice things. I'm not going to say it's not because I, I do like nice things. But if it becomes an idol, then you have to have it to where you're putting yourself in debt for it. Be very careful. Because that need to keep up with the Joneses will overtake you. And let me share something with you. Anything that God, that God does not give you, you have to maintain. So if you decide to go out and buy a lemon, you have to maintain that lemon. Because if not, you can't get from point A to point B. God is not going to promote or put you in debt for something. He won't do it. It's not his will. You are to be a, bo a borrower of none. Because he supplies all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. He knows what you need. Materialism will pull you out of position because if you're constantly trying to keep up all of these things, what ends up happening is that they become more important and that maintaining of them becomes more important than the presence of God in your life. So now you have to wash your car. Now you have to figure out how you're going to work X amount of hours to pay for all of the credit card debt that you've accumulated because you had to have the bag that you ended up leaving somewhere anyways, and now it's lost. It's a vicious cycle. And I'm speaking from personal experience. I was so caught up for a long time with having to have this and having to have that. After a while, it's just, what does it matter? Everything changes, literally. I mean, you got freaking high-rise jeans back in style and and then low riser back in style and then high rise again. It's just, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant keeping up, it's a constant need for self-gratification. And that self-gratification isn't of God. It's self-seeking. The fourth thing, or I'm sorry, the fifth thing is, um, and I already talked about inconsistency, it kind of stems with double-mindedness, but it's emotional inconsistency. So, if you're happy one day and completely miserable the next, you have and are expressing a fruit of a betrayal. Because somebody who is led by their emotions is extremely dangerous. An emotional roller coaster will put you through more than many things will. Dealing with people who are emotionally unhealed. I can tell you that when we work with the guys and the girls in the program and their emotions are all over the place, it affects the staff. It affects your house managers. It affects your brothers and sisters. It affects everyone. You have to want to be emotionally consistent because if it's not peace, joy, and righteousness, it's not of the Lord. Okay? So if you're finding yourself not in peace, not in joy, and not in righteousness, there's something up there and it's not the Holy Spirit. The sixth thing is going to be compromise. If you find yourself compromising, you're expressing a heart of deception, a fruit of a betrayer. Anything that you are willing to compromise on in order to have will inevitably betray you. So, for example, guys and girls, if you're willing to compromise with one another in talking, what makes you think that that person is going to sit there and be faithful to you if they can't be faithful to the rules and regulations in place? What makes you think that that person is going to be faithful to you if you guys choose to leave here and be together, if they couldn't be faithful to God in the first place. Anything you are willing to compromise on will inevitably betray you. Because it's compromise. And compromise is not 
these big grandiose things. It's the little foxes. You got blessed with money. Did you tithe off that money? You aren't supposed to have milk. You went and had a glass of milk because you could. You're not supposed to talk to the, the opposite sex yet. Oh, well, we were just saying hi. We were just passing by. You're still compromising. It's the little foxes that destroy the crop. Okay? And um, this is the thing. Another thing with compromise, and I pulled this from the Amplified Bible, so you guys don't have to go there, but in Proverbs 23, verses 6 through 8, it says, Do not eat the bread of a selfish man or desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is, in behavior, one who manipulates. He says to you, eat and drink, yet his heart is not with you, but it is begrudging the cost. The morsel which you have eaten you will vomit up, and you will waste your compliments. So understand, in that in the New King James Version, it says, do not eat the bread of a miser. So the pastor likens this to compromiser, but it says, do not eat the bread of a selfish man. So understand that when you're willing to compromise, you are operating in an area of selfishness. And selfishness and selflessness cannot coexist with one another. Number seven, and this is probably the most important thing, the most important fruit is that you lack a prayer life. So if you get up in the morning and your first function is to go to work, you got a problem. God should get your first fruits in everything, including your time in the morning. He comes first. That sets the, that sets the course of your day. If you are not willing to put God first, God is really not a priority in your life because you will make priority and first for what is most important to you. So if you find yourself texting your spouse or the person that you're in a relationship with before you say good morning to the Lord, be very careful because that person is an idol and they come before God and God is jealous and they will be removed if you truly have a heart after him because he's not going to share first place with anyone. He won't. Your lack of prayer life also stems from where is your time most spent? Do you guys watch sports all the time? Do you guys watch TV all the time? Is your favorite pastime going to restaurants and going out with people? Really uh, self-examine there. If you have extra time and you're not thinking, what can I do with the Lord? You lack prayer life. You lack a relationship with the Lord. And that is a huge red flag and a huge indicator that you have a heart stemmed in betrayal. Because, again, God should come first. God should be first. He should be all. He should be number one. Number eight is you are unable to control your tongue and or your fingers. Meaning, it might not just be your tongue you can't control. If you find the need that you have to text incessantly and come back at something when somebody makes you angry, you have a problem. And it is a fruit of somebody who's willing to betray. Anyone who is unable to bridle their tongue you speak out of order, you speak out what you feel, you're dangerous. So it says in Isaiah 57, or I'm sorry, 53 verse 7, let's go there for a second, because there's two, two uh, sides to this. You can choose to speak when you shouldn't speak, and you can choose not to speak when you should speak. And I love this because, um, if I can get there, the Lord was... Um, dealing with me once, and um, I wanted so badly to prove my point and to tell my side of the story because God knows I needed to vindicate myself because he was incapable of doing it, right? And so I wanted to tell my story, and I remember years and years ago, I was in counsel with Kate, and she said, he opened not his mouth. And so Isaiah 53, verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears and is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And it's reiterated there, he opened not his mouth. Meaning you can be going through crap. You can be going through the worst experience of your life. You could be going through frustration, hardships, whatever the cost may be or whatever the thing may be. You don't need to verbalize it to everybody in the world. Take it to the Lord. 
go to the Lord with what's hindering you, what's hurting you, with what you want vindication on or what you feel has been done to you. It doesn't need to be contaminating every single other person around you. Because if your heart's not in a pure place, your tongue's not in a pure place, and if you're not speaking the right things to other people, you are contaminating them, and you are setting a trap for them as well. Be careful about grumbling and complaining, guys, because it will, it will snare you. It'll eat you up. And this is the thing. It is healthy to get counsel. It is not healthy to seek counsel from every single person there is to find somebody to agree with you. That is what's not healthy. Okay? Number nine. And this is something that slapped me in the face. The last fruit that I have, which there's a lot of them, but this, this I think kind of covers a lot, is you need a title and a position. And this is the thing. Many scholars um, believe also that the reason Judas betrayed Jesus wasn't for just the money, but it was for political position. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, so I'm not going to say that it is or it isn't. But if you find yourself wanting or needing a position or a title, you are severely filled with pride, and you are not in any way loyal to the Lord. You will betray the Lord. Because God is the one who promotes and exalts. It is not a self-promotion. I hear so many people, oh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to be this. I'm going to go out and I'm going to be that. And even myself, I was guilty of it. I want to be this. Who am I? Who is he? It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. So if you find yourself needing to have a ministry, needing to have, uh, I'm this and I'm that, if you find yourself throwing your title around, be very careful because that title, again, is an idol. And you will betray the Lord quickly. Quickly, quickly, quickly. I'll never forget, Clarence asked me in, in the store one day, because I had done like a 180, and I, I really, it was a 180 that stemmed from about a year of extreme turmoil. And he said, what changed with you? And I told him, I said, I stopped hating myself. And the thing of it is, is that when you have a heart that stemmed in betrayal, that Judas heart, that heart that, that will betray, you can't even like yourself. You can't stand yourself. And so when you can't stand who you are, you make everybody else around you miserable because misery loves company. So if you find yourself constantly negative, constantly grumbling, constantly, why does this happen to me? And you find yourself spewing on other people because if they're with you in misery, then it somewhat mitigates what you're going through. You're off base hugely. And you're not walking in the character of Christ. Again, peace, joy, and righteousness. If that's not it, get rid of it. Go into the mirror, cast it out of you. That you have dominion and authority of. What's in you? Take the axe to the root. Whatever you need to unearth to produce Christ-likeness in you, do it. So, and that, that stems up to number two. You want to nail Judas to the cross. You want to cause anguish to and destroy the betrayer within your heart. Because if not, you will backslide. You will go back. You know, I'm, I'm saying stuff like that because we have, you know, our residents in here. But it's the truth. If you guys don't expose that area of your heart, you will go backwards. You know, I was married to somebody who went through the program, and he was one of the greatest people I knew. Phenomenal guy. But he was never fulfilled. And it killed him. He wanted, first, he wanted me. Then that wasn't enough. Then he wanted the best position at work. Once he got that, that wasn't enough. Then he wanted more money. Once he got that, it wasn't enough. Then he wanted the best body. Once he got that, it wasn't enough. You will never be fulfilled until you expose that hidden, deep-seated root of betrayal within your heart because you will always go back. And when he had it all, that's when Satan pulled the hook. And he went back. And he went back and he lost it all. And now he's no longer alive because he wasn't willing to expose the truth within his heart. He had a life stemmed in deceit. And this is important because people cheat and they steal and they lie and they betray because their heart is not conformed. 
you're either going to be a beloved or you're going to be a betrayer. You're either going to express Jesus or you're going to express darkness. You're going to express light. You're going to ex- express inconsistencies. You're going to express consistency. It is one or the other. If you find yourself going back and forth constantly between the two, you are double-minded. If you find yourself going back and forth between the two, you have a heart stemmed in betrayal, and eventually it will overtake you. This is vitally important because time's running out, guys. The world's not getting any better, and I'm not a doom and gloom kind of girl. I like sunshines. I like rainbows. But it's matter of fact. Schools are not safe for our kids anymore. Restrooms are uh, transgender, and you know everyone can kind of cohabitate with one another. That did not fly when I was growing up at all. Look at the world in the way that it is. Do you really want to leave a legacy for your kids if you have children? Being somebody who constantly goes in and out of their life, do you really want to leave a legacy as a believer and a witness to somebody else that this is what a Christian life is like, up and down, up and down, in and out. Because that's not how people come to know Christ. That's what pushes people away from Christ. And so the third thing is you want to live a life of a seeker. And how you live a life of a seeker is you completely lay everything before the Lord. You search for him with all of your heart. Because I can tell you, until you do that, you will constantly be unfulfilled. People search for false fulfillment because they don't fully seek after God. And seeking is not passive, it's active. You are on your face before the Lord. You're, you're petitioning the Lord to expose every area within yourself that is unholy, that is impure. If you guys have extra time in the houses, spend time with the Lord. Spend as much time with him as you can. Trust me, you will regret not doing it when you have the opportunity to. But I'm telling you, if you live a life of a seeker, you will have identity in the Lord. He will be your fulfillment, and you won't go back. People go back because they compromise that lifestyle, that walk. And it's vitally important, guys. It's vitally important. It has nothing to do with our worthiness, but everything to do with the Lord's worthiness. And if he does nothing else for us, he died on the cross for us. That was enough to give us salvation, to give us hope, to give us a future. If you find yourself expecting more from God or being frustrated that you're not further along, woe to you. Big time. Big time. Because we have it made here in America. We really do. I want to close with Psalm 15. verses, if you guys want to speak along, verses 1 through 5. Ready. It says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle, who may dwell in your holy hill, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart, he who does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things will never be moved. So the goal here, when exposing that heart, the Jewish heart of betrayal, is so that you become immovable. Nine months does not make a completely whole person, but it is a great step starting point. It is a great starting point. But understand, your walk is a consistent walk of mountaintops and valleys. God can do more in your life in a surrendered five months than he will in a managed five years. Jesus 
have to lay it all down. All of it. Your kids, your spouses, your wants, your desires. You know, I'll never forget, I went into counsel, and um, I, I was frustrated with, with life. And the pastor said to me, like very, very, like, point blank, he's like, why do you make decisions that cause you to run? And I said, what do you mean? I'm not running, I'm here. He goes, yeah, but you're always running. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you're always making decisions that will pull you out of position. Why? And that's where I, it hit me like a ton of bricks when I heard the words again, betrayer or beloved. It was the Lord not giving me a title for a message. It was the Lord asking me, are you a betrayer or are you a beloved? And it really impacted my heart. For years, I struggled with lack of identity. For years, I didn't know what I wanted out of life. Now I don't care. I just want to live for him. And until that becomes your heart's desire, you will struggle. And do I think everybody that comes in here is going to want to be in love with Jesus for the rest of their life? No. But you should, because there's no one more worthy. And in him you have everything. I mean, you saw the testimony of Jason on Sunday, how God's restored everything. You've got examples in Katie. You've got examples in Shane. You've got examples in a lot of people here that have undergone being faithful to the Lord, have undergone denying themselves. And look at how much God has done in their lives. That's what you hold on to, and that's what you look to. But you don't look for what God can give you. You just look for him, and he establishes everything else. All right? So, Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for moving us out of the way and for just being with us with your presence. And, Lord, I just ask that you would pause this. Lord, just to continue to bear fruit, Lord, that you would allow it to permeate deep within our hearts, Father, and that you would keep our heart posture pure before you. Lord, anything in us that is corruptible, anything in us that is doubtful of who you are, Lord, I just ask that you would remove it and place certainty within our hearts, certainty that we are meant to be here for a reason, certainty that we are new creations in Christ, and certainty that you have so much more than we could ever hope for or think. And we give you all glory, all honor, and all praise in Jesus' name. Amen.